So our topic, uh, geopolitics of money, or maybe a, a more blunt or succinct way of saying that is, is financial warfare, because that really is what we're talking about. Uh, I got into a debate, I, um, I lecture on this topic or do seminars on this topic with the U.S. Army War College, uh, their Advanced Strategic Arts Program, and one of the participants said, well, I don't consider financial warfare to be warfare. Uh, if you're shooting or blowing things up or whatever, that's fine, but if it's money, it's something else, and uh, it's a little bit semantic, but uh, I think there's plenty of evidence today that uh, financial weapons are not only powerful, they can actually be decisive in ways they haven't been in the past. The, the first point I want to make is there's nothing new about financial warfare or the linkage, let's say, between kinetic warfare and finance. And there are many, many examples, but one of my favorites was in 1914 at the outbreak of World War I, um, almost all the belligerents closed their capital accounts. They, there had been a long, uh, so-called classical gold standard from 1870 to, uh, to 1914, but they suddenly uh, stopped shipments of gold, kept the gold they had. They knew they would need the gold to finance the war effort, so the gold market practically shut down, uh, except in the United States, which was not a belligerent. We didn't jump in until 1917, so we were technically neutral. But the question at, uh, in the UK, at uh, His Majesty's Treasury, and the exchequer was, uh, should the UK go off the gold standard or maintain some kind of convertibility? And John Maynard Keynes was the, the, the leading advocate to the point of fierceness that the UK should not go off the gold standard or, or should, in other words, should maintain the convertibility of sterling into gold. Uh, and I love pointing this out because everyone thinks that Keynes was, was gold hater, this great gold hater, but at the beginning and the end of his career, he was a, a very staunch advocate for gold. But what he said, uh, was critical. Uh, he said, if we maintain convertibility into gold, we will maintain our credit, and the war will be won with credit. No one had the money to, uh, to fight a war or self-finance, but if you could borrow money, uh, you could do that. And that is exactly what happened. In the next two years, the House of Morgan, Pierpont Morgan, uh, sorry, it was Jack Morgan at the time, organized uh, several hundred million dollars worth of loans. That was in uh, nominal value at the time, worth far more, of course, today for uh, the UK and France, and nothing for Germany. Morgan had zero loans for Germany. So, and that was critical in helping the UK to win the war. Of course, you know, the sacrifices are made on the battlefield, but you can't afford those battlefield operations if you don't have the finance. So, uh, Keynes got it exactly right. Uh, but that was a, uh, an early example of using, in effect, the financial component of warfare, or financial warfare, if you, uh, if you want to put it that way. Another example, uh, again, there are many, in uh, July 1941, uh, President Roosevelt, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, froze all Japanese assets that were reachable by the U.S. banking system. In August 1941, uh, he imposed a, an embargo on uh, imports of oil to Japan, basically cut Japan off from the oil. Of course, Japan has no oil, so uh, they have to in, import basically 100% of what they need. In December 1941, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. Uh, now, I don't want to say that FDR's actions were the direct proximate cause of Pearl Harbor. That uh, attack had been in the planning since January of 1941. But we all know that military plans can be canceled or changed. Uh, so I think the record is very clear that FDR's financial warfare, and that's what it was, was one of the factors, at least, that led to the Japanese decision to attack Pearl Harbor. So this interaction has always been there. So what, that being the case, What's new about financial warfare? Why is it a particularly important topic today? Uh, and the answer is that because of the uh, diversity or complexity of financial instruments, there are a lot more than there used to be, uh, because of the interconnectedness of the financial system, financial warfare today can be decisive. You can start a war, pursue it, and win it without firing a shot using financial weapons exclusively. And that is new because, again, it was always a compliment but today you can run it completely with financial weapons. And a good example of that, in, uh, in December 2012, or sorry, in, in 2012, the United States was in a financial war with Iran. You know, we weren't shooting, there was a little bit of sabotage and some assassinations going on, but uh, we were, but there was not a shooting war with Iran at the time, but we were in a financial war. First, we cut Iran out of the dollar payment system, and uh, uh, Professor, uh, um, uh, 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 I'm sorry, uh, our, our, uh, I'm just uh, spacing on our, our speaker last night, but uh, Larry Summers, I apologize. Professor Summers 
uh, talked about the payment system. He said it rarely rises to the top of uh, you know, headline-making news, but it's, but it's a critical part of the financial structure. We kicked Iran out of the dollar payment system, which we control uh, through Fedwire and through the Treasury. And Iran kind of shrugged and said, fine, we'll sell our oil for euros. We can get euros through SWIFT. Uh, who cares about the dollar? We can, we can get by with euros. But the U.S. prevailed on its allies, who comprised the board of SWIFT. And they didn't want to do this, but we put enough pressure on them that they kicked Iran out of SWIFT. Uh, SWIFT is the international payment system. It's kind of the, uh, SWIFT keeps saying we're not a financial institution, we're a communications network, which is true. But the message traffic uh, basically is all the, all the large payments, all the hard currencies in the world run through SWIFT. It's, it's, if you want to pinpoint the nerve center of the global financial system, that's probably it. Well, this was serious because now Iran couldn't get yen or euros or uh, any other currency in addition to the dollar for its oil. So, for example, they could and did ship oil to India, and India could pay them in rupees deposited in an Indian bank for the account of Iran. That's not a payment that had to run through SWIFT, but what's Iran going to do with the rupees? I mean, how much you know, do they really want to buy from India? Um, so that really put a chokehold on Iran. The, uh, there was a dollar shortage. They, you know, the Iranians like their, their iPhones and their HP printers as much as we do. Uh, they bring a lot of it smuggled in from Dubai. They couldn't pay for it. There were dollars coming in from Iraq because we had spread a lot of physical dollars around Iraq in the years before. Um, and you know, under pain of death, people were smuggling those in. The black market uh, rate of the real, the exchange rate between the real, Iranian real and the dollar uh, fell by half. Uh, and of course, the black market rate is the real rate. Uh, the central bank uh, raised interest rates to 20% to try to keep uh, deposits in the banking system so they wouldn't flee the banking system and go to the black market and get dollars. So they had hyperinflation, a currency collapse, 20% interest rates, run on the bank, shortage of consumer goods, social unrest was on the rise, and finally Iran came to the table and said to the Obama administration, okay, we'll meet and we'll talk with you about uh, our enrichment program and our weapons program, and that led to the JCPOA, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, in 2015. Um, not long ago, I had a debate with a senior Treasury official who was uh, during the, uh, official during the Obama administration. I said, uh, hey, n nice job on the financial war. You used all the right weapons. You were very skillful at deploying them. They were extremely effective. We were halfway to regime change without firing a shot. Why did you stop? Why didn't you just keep going and finish the job? And he said, well, we got what we wanted. We wanted to get them to the table, and we did get them to the table, and therefore we accomplished our goal, and so there was no point in going any further. Um, the, the point of the story is that we're back to that point. President Trump tore up the JCPOA, reinitiated the financial war using the same instruments I just described, uh, a policy that they called maximum pressure. Secretary Pompeo uh, refers to it as, uh, as maximum pressure. And it's having the same effect, but worse, worse for Iran. They got about $150 billion, they, Iran, got $150 billion for the United States in cash and gold. And by the way, the cash was in euros. The Iranians didn't want the dollars. They had to go to the Central Bank of the Netherlands to get the euros to ship them in by the pallet. And an undisclosed amount of gold, but, but perhaps as much as $10 billion in gold. Um, but Iran took that money and used it in Yemen, Sinai, uh, uh, Gaza, uh, Lebanon, uh, and elsewhere around the Middle East to support their uh, terrorist activities or their anti-Saudi uh, Arabian activities, civil wars, et cetera, and they, they spent most of it on those activities. They don't have much left. They, they still have the gold. No one knows exactly how much gold they have. They don't have that much left. So now we're applying the same pressure. They're not getting the plain loads of uh, currency and gold. Uh, the social unrest is increasing. Um, except now the people are like, hey, we did this deal, you got the money, where's the money, and why is this happening again, why is it worse, uh, and there's even less trust in the government. So we're going back down the same path we were in, on in 2012 with a different president who doesn't have quite the same short-term objective. Now, if Iran came to the table without preconditions, I don't doubt that President Trump would meet um, you know, Iranian, senior Iranian officials in uh, you know, Geneva or uh, Vienna or someplace. Uh, and start a dialogue, as he has with North Korea. But, um, but so far, they haven't indicated they're willing to do that. But the Trump administration has, has shown no signs that they're willing to back off. So we are on a road to regime change. But my point as it relates to financial warfare is we haven't fired a shot. You know, when Iran shot down our drone, 
the whole world was kind of waiting for President Trump to fire some cruise missiles into the command and control center for drone operations in Iran, and it never happened. And everyone said, well, that's good. You know, we avoided a war with Iran. No, we didn't. We're in a war. It's just a financial war. It's not a shooting war. No one's going to, you know, the 82nd Airborne isn't going to drop into Tehran anytime soon. Tommy Franks is not going to march to Tehran. But we're in a war. Make no mistake about it. It's going to get worse. Uh, and we'll see if how the Iranians react to that. So, so that's what's new about it, which is you, you, because of the, the weapons uh, and the interconnectedness and secondary boycotts, et cetera, you can be a lot, a lot more effective. Uh, and, and you can actually do it uh, in isolation, not in isolation, but without, without kinetic warfare. Um, and there's one reason for this, which is the role of the dollar, uh, which has rarely been more dominant. I understand, you know, in the, in the Bretton Woods system, when the dollar was linked to gold, the, the role it played. But today, the, the, the dollar represents 60% of global reserves. So 60% of all the reserves in the world are denominated in dollars. Dollars about 80% of global payments. It's nearly 100% of uh, energy payments. So oil, natural gas are all uh, largely denominated in, uh, in dollars. If we cut you off from the dollar payment system, that's like going into intensive care in a hospital and turning you off a patient's oxygen. They're going to die. You know what's going to happen. If we cut you off from dollars, uh, your economy is going to die in stages, and that's exactly what we're doing to, uh, to Iran. So that's, the, that's the, the weapon of choice. What's in the toolkit? So I obviously mentioned the importance of the dollar. Um, it's a long list. I'm not going to hit every item. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on every item. But we have, um, I'll just mention a few of the, uh, the big ones. Uh, seizures of assets. Everyone goes, oh, the United States wouldn't, wouldn't seize assets. We do it all the time. We're really good at it. So we got bare aspirin in World War I. Uh, we just took it from the Germans, but the U.S. doesn't hesitate to do that. When President Roosevelt confiscated Americans' gold in 1933 by executive order, some people said, well, what was the statutory authority, if any, for the executive order? Well, it was. It was the Trading with the Enemy Act of 1917. Uh, well, I'm not sure who the enemy was. I guess it was the American people. But that's, that's what Roosevelt's lawyers cited as their authority for that executive order to seize the gold. So we do that all the time. Account freezes. Obviously, the Iranians haven't been uh, short-sighted enough to leave much in the U.S. banking system since the late 1970s. But um, we can use that for secondary boycotts. Uh, embargoes, obviously, uh, we've told uh, the world, basically, if you, you can do business with Iran or you can do business with the United States. But you can't do both. And if you're buying oil from Iran, with very few exceptions, or transacting with them, facilitating payments for them, et cetera, you can forget about doing any business in the United States. Um, this is where the, the payment system uh, that uh, Professor Summers mentioned last night comes into play. Um, we've weaponized CFIUS. Uh, when you say CFIUS, uh, people who don't know it say, does it uh, itch or burn? Uh, but it's an acronym. It stands for Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. And it basically allows the United States government to deny foreign firms the ability to acquire U.S. firms on national security grounds. Um, and it, historically, uh, it was a very accommodating thing. The Treasury, and the, uh, Treasury Department is really the, sort of the secretariat. They do national security reviews, but they always try to find ways to let the acquisitions go through, uh, with very few exceptions. Now it's the opposite. Uh, I, I don't think a Chinese company could buy you know, an ice cream company in the United States, let alone, uh, you know, a telecommunications company, a computer company, a defense contractor. They can forget all those things. Huawei might as well, you know, fold up their tent and leave. Um, and uh, we're applying it to other countries as well. So um, the Congress recently enhanced the CFIUS powers uh, last year by, by amending that in ways to give the president even more authority. So forget about acquisitions. Um, I mentioned the payment system. Secondary boycotts, so people say, well, hasn't, hasn't Europe or hasn't the EU worked out, done a workaround around the U.S. dollar payment system so they can do business with Iran because they want to preserve what's left of the JCPOA, et cetera? Yes, and they've done some technological development on that. Don't try using it. Because if you use it, we'll know who you are and we'll ban you from the U.S. anyway or, uh, or assign uh, penalties or other sanctions on you. So yeah, yeah, that system works, but it's only going to cause you to be hurt or sanctioned by the United States uh, in other ways. Tariffs, um, a lot of people say, well, wait a second, tariffs, that's, that's economic policy, that's trade war, what does it have to do with financial war, et cetera, or geopolitics or national security? 
Ask Mexico. President Trump said he was going to put a, uh, a high tariff on 100% of uh, imports from Mexico to the United States if they didn't do something about immigration. And then, you know, about a week later, maybe less, he said, well, we're not doing that. And everyone said, well, there goes Trump again. He's just flip-flopping. He says one thing one day, one thing the next day. No. Mexico responded. Uh, illegal immigration through Mexico is down about 15% since the president made that threat. And it wasn't a threat, he would have carried through with it, except the Mexicans actually reacted, bearing in mind it's a left-leaning government in Mexico that doesn't really have much of a problem with uh, immigrants from Central America coming in. But they responded, uh, and that's a significant decrease in illegal immigration. So there's a, there's a weaponized uh, a tariff for you. And I'll just mention the, the last one, uh, another acronym, IEPA. International Emergency Economics Powers Act of 1977. This was enacted during the Carter administration. I'll give you the five second version. It gives the president dictatorial powers over finance and capital markets if there's a national security issue involved. Now there's some after the fact congressional approval, but the threshold for using IEPA is extremely low. It's almost whatever the president says. And go back to the Roman Republic, you know, dictator wasn't a bad word. They, a dictator was appointed for two years, he had term limits, but when there was an urgent crisis, they said we have to get away from the regular governance system of councils and tribunes, et cetera, and we'll appoint a dictator to deal with you know, Hannibal or whoever is coming in. That's the kind of power the president has, and it's used almost daily. Every time the Treasury comes out with one of these, you know, this oligarch is sanctioned or this bank is sanctioned, it's always under the authority of EPA, but it can be used more broadly uh, and more uh, definitively, more, uh, in a more blunt way, um, as part of, the, uh, part of the toolkit. So the way I explain this is, um, is something, I, again, I worked out for the, for the U.S. Army War College. It's a spectrum. Uh, and over here we have things that we would re regard as normal economic competition, you know, unit labor costs and tax policies and all those things that go into that. And then you come out, you know, unfair trade practices, tariffs, um, you know, subsidies, non-tariff barriers, et cetera. But keep going down the spectrum and you get into the other things I've discussed, you know, seizures, uh, seizures uh, freezes, uh, secondary boycotts, embargoes, penalties, fines, uh, and then, uh, you know, as I say, the weaponization of CFIUS. And then you get into more nefarious acts, uh, hacking, infrastructure attacks, et cetera. Well, th well there's a spectrum, but it's, it's a fine line. It's not easy to know when you have moved from something that would be regarded as either normal economic competition or maybe unfair economic condition into financial warfare. But uh, the advice I give them is, is understand you're on a spectrum. And if you're moving out to one end, you're getting closer to something that really should be regarded as war. So that's the, um, that's the big picture. Noriel, I'll let, uh, I, I, one of my problems is I talk too much. Yeah. There's a lot more to say, but uh, maybe uh, well, put it over to you. Okay, so, you know, I mean, um, uh, in reaction to what you say, I would make the following observations. First of all, there is financial warfare. I mean, there are long studies have been made about the impacts of, say, sanctions, trade sanctions, financial sanctions. I think the Peter in Peterson Institute wrote a whole book about whether effective or not. And the historical evidence is that if you're trying to do either regime change or even changing the policies of a government, uh, economic and financial sanctions uh, are not very effective. They take usually a long period of time. You know, historically, there were the famous examples in the 60s, 70s, and 80s of, say, economic sanction against, uh, uh, you know, racist regimes like Rhodesia or South Africa. They were imposed for a long time by many countries around the world. Of course, at that time, both regimes were able then to find some allies and try to bypass them. So the whole result is that uh, if there is a lot of leakage, because you have uh, essentially uh, ways of finding other sources of economic trade. Those economic sanctions don't work. Uh, sometimes imposing costs not only on the country on which you're imposing sanction, but you're also imposing cost on yourself. If the cost on yourself because you're restricting trade are higher, then those types of economic warfare is not very effective. And, and I would say a fair reading of the data would be that, you know, eventually there was a regime change both in Rhodesia, became Zimbabwe, and in South Africa, but uh, it took decades and probably the triggering factors of those regime changes were not the economic sanctions, even if of course at the margin those type of economic sanctions had something of an impact. 
So, so, and then there are very few countries in the world that have the economic and financial part of the United States. If you're a little small country, you can impose any economic sanction you want against an enemy. It's not going to be particularly effective. That's another caveat. So coordinated sanction by most of the world with our leakages, with the cost mostly on the other country other than yourself, may make those things effective, but it takes time. Uh, I think that even the evidence about the current, uh, uh, if you're going to the present as opposed to the far past, is that, you know, yeah, there is financial warfare, but if your result uh, or objective is either regime change or a significant change in economic policies or foreign policy or security of a country, uh, it's not obvious to me that financial warfare works. You know, we've had, for example, economic sanction against Cuba for the last, you know, what, 60 plus years. There hasn't been regime change in Cuba. And actually, some people would argue that uh, it was at the moment in time in which we had the detente and we had an opening up of economic trade uh, with the Soviet Union that eventually that kind of a trade led also to changes that eventually led to the triggering and the collapse of the Soviet Union and the countries behind the Iron Curtain. And maybe the reason why Cuba is still, unquote, nominally communist today is because we have not changed them. And the entire logic, by the way, of the Joint uh, Comprehensive Plan of Action, uh, and I think it was a good logic, was, uh, uh, you know, if you want to change uh, Iran, the young generations are all uh, uh, very secular, they want regime change, they voted for Rouhani and other moderates. Uh, sanctions have not worked. If we do a deal on the, the nuclear side and then we open up on trade, it's not going to happen overnight, but give it 5, 10, 15 years, regime change is going to occur. And by the way, the impact, you know, I'm of uh, Iranian origin, Jewish Iranian, but if there's one thing I know is that these economic sanctions are not going to lead to regime change in, in, in Iran. Uh, forget about it. You know, they suffered much more when they had a war for 10 years with Iraq. Millions of people died. Uh, of course, there is economic pressure on the regime. But the paradox is that when there is that type of economic pressure, even those that are against the regime, uh, first of all, become nationalistic because they are patriotic. First observation. Secondly, the regime can always blame the great Satan for the collapse of economic activity, high inflation. And again, uh, you blame it on the United States. So if the objective is regime change, tell you the truth, the, the Iranians are going to wait out and hope that there is a regime change actually in the United States if uh, Trump gets out of power and some Democrats come to power and going back to the Joint Comprehensive Plans of Action. So it didn't work with Cuba. It's not going to work with Iran. We've imposed economic sanctions recently against North Korea. Uh, the regime has not collapsed. Yeah, eventually they came to the next sitting table. But these negotiations have gone nowhere, like they've not gone nowhere. We've, uh, with Bush, with Obama, with uh, Clinton and so on. Why? Uh, you know, uh, Kim Jong un is smart enough that he knows that uh, his only essentially weapon against uh, regime change is, uh, is having the nuclear bomb. You know, when, uh, when Gaddafi gave up on the bomb and the option of that one, then we went and we had regime change. So he's not going to give up on that one. So those sanctions have not changed anything of the behavior of North Korea. We imposed sanctions recently against Russia because of what happened with the Ukraine situation and so on. Again, no regime change. Uh, Putin is as popular as ever. They were actually done fiscal adjustment, monetary fiscal and others that have actually stabilized the economy. The risk of a financial crisis in Russia is minimal. Actually, from a macro point of view right now, fiscal condition, monetary policy, inflation are much better than they were before. They incentivated them to have a macroeconomic stability. So there is no regime change. And now we started another trade war and tech war with China. Uh, if the objective is regime change, forget about it. If the objective is even changing their own economic policy, it's not totally obvious that's going to happen. So. My lesson is whether it's Cuba, whether it's Iran, whether it's North Korea, whether it's Russia, or it's China, we're playing like a bully. We're using a variety of trade and financial sanctions. Uh, if the objective is regime change, absolutely not. If the objective is changing economic policy, not at all. If the objective changes in the policies of the country, uh, we have not achieved anything uh, about it. Additional point I think is important. Uh, we know that country can retaliate. If we start a trade war, against a small country, maybe like Mexico, we can force them and bully them to maybe cooperate. And even that one is an if. But if it's a, a trade war, say, with China or with Europe, uh, there can be retaliation. They can also retaliate and impose tariff against us. 
the argument that China cannot really retaliate us against us because uh, they export to us 550 billion while we export to them only 150, so they're going to run out of bullets is not correct either because, you know, China, if they want really to retaliate against the United States, they can do many other things once they run out of the tariffs. They can let the currency depreciate and therefore undo some of the effect of, um, of the imposition of the tariff and they've let their currency the weekend from six towards seven this year. Uh, they can impose a variety of non-other tariff-free barriers, and they can go after U.S. businesses that have done business in China. U.S. has done hundreds of billions of dollars of investment in China, and um, you know, if uh, this trade and tech war is going to escalate, China could say, "We're going to expropriate you, or we're going to kick you out of China." Or when there were tension between China and Japan, or China and Korea, uh, they had a boycott of uh, Korean goods and Japanese goods. So that was a cost that the country imposed. So you can play a bully with uh, small kids, but you cannot bully with somebody who's as big as you. And certainly China is as big as you, uh, the, uh, the European Union is as big as you. Economically, this, uh, Russia is not as big as you, it's a declining power, but uh, militarily it's pretty big. And they can do other things against you, like destabilize things in the Middle East and so on. So, so there is always the, the issue of retaliation. And there's a whole spectrum of things that the Chinese can do that goes on the direction of the financial sanctions that lead you to eventually lead to that. Another point that I think is important, that is relevant for the case of, of, of Iran. Uh, people forget that uh, there have been uh, at least three global recessions, stagflationary, that have been caused by a geopolitical crisis in the Middle East. Um, many of you are too young to remember, I'm not, I was a, a young teenager. 1973, Yom Kippur between Israel and the Arab states. What do the Arab states do? Because the US was an ally of, uh, and Europe was an ally of, of Israel. They impose an oil embargo. Oil prices triple overnight, October of uh, 73, and we had a stagflation, high uh, inflation, double digit, and recession in 74, 75 severe recession, a big stagflation recession in US and the global economy. 1979, uh, Iranian revolution, the Mullahs has come to power, another embargo against the United States and the great Satan and so on, another spike in oil prices, severe double deep recession in 1882. And even, even the 1990-91 recession that was caused more by the SNL crisis and the collapse of the banks and the credit crunch was in part driven by the June uh, Iraq invasion of Kuwait that spiked again all prices and led then to a recession in the US and globally that lasted, but guess what, between June of 1990 when the invasion of, of Kuwait uh, occurred and February of 1991 when finally after the invasion of Kuwait, uh, the, the oil supply started again and oil prices collapsed and we, we came back to normal. So, so the, the weapon that, by the way, Iran has right now, it's a complicated issue because of course, if these things escalate to the point of war, the U.S. could destroy many of the military installations of Iran. Is but if a full-scale were to occur war between U.S. and Iran, one of the consequences is going to be first of all, even before there is a shock to the actual supply of oil, fear premium goes higher. And historically, we have seen whenever there is tension in the least, the fear premium can by itself, even without an actual supply shock, lead to a spike in oil prices. And secondly, if there is an actual supply shock. For example, the Iranians, for a period of time, could block the Street of Hormuz by essentially putting a mine around it. They can bomb the hell out of the pipelines that go from the Gulf towards the other side, towards the Gulf of Aqaba. And there has been an attack by maybe Houthis against those pipelines. Then that shock by itself could spike all prices from the current $60 per barrel to say $120 per barrel or higher. Then you have a U.S. and global recession, and granted, in that case, uh, Trump is not going to win the election because you're going to have a nasty recession and inflation right before the election. So there are things that even Iran and a small country can do to you to retaliate against you that have an economic impact on you. So before you believe that you're, you are all-powerful, that you can use financial welfare to go after big countries like Europe or China or Russia or even a smaller country, like Iran that have military power and they have other types of power that affects the oil price and therefore the global economy, then you have to think about whether you want to use those tools or not. Final observation I'll make is the following one. I do believe that we are at the beginning of a trade and a tech and a cold war between US and China. Uh, and I'm not making a normative statement on whether 
China is evil or is not evil. You know, I was about four years ago in Beijing as part of the delegation. We met President Xi Jinping and unprompted, President Xi Jinping started his remarks and for 10 minutes he spoke about something that I knew about but most people didn't know about. He spoke about literally the Thucydides trap. As you know, Thucydides was the Greek historian that wrote that book about the rise of uh, Athens, how it had threatened Sparta, and then where the rising power facing the existing power led to a clash and a war. And the term to see this trap has become now popular because Graham Allison from the Harvard has written this famous book in 2017, after our meeting actually with President Xi Jinping, in which he says, titled Destined to War, Will US and China avoid the Thucydides trap. And his point is that in 12 out of 16 historical episodes, whenever rising power rises and faces an existing power, military conflict does occur. He was telling us about the Thucydides power uh, trap because he was saying the rise of China is peaceful, don't worry about it. We are not militaristic. We don't want to control the world economically, financially, politically, and we'll find a way to actually manage the rivalry with the United States. Guess what? Unfortunately, the US right now is insecure. It's economic power and financial power and geopolitical power in absolute and relative term is reduced because there is a rise of China. And whether you like it or not, the US thinks and the new national security strategy of the US says explicitly, under Obama was we compete and we cooperate with China. The new one instead says China is a strategic rival and effectively, not formally, but de facto, is a strategy of containing China. You have to contain China economically, financially, trade, politically, militarily, geopolitically. We know that actually when you try to contain a country as strong as China, eventually a cold war could become even a hot war. I do not expect a hot war between US and China to occur, but think about the consequences of a trade and a tech war. We will have massive beginning of deglobalization of the global economy after having had 30 or 40 years since 1979 when uh, Deng Xiaoping opened China or since 1989 when there was the collapse of the Soviet Union. We had 40 years of globalization. We'll begin a process of deglobalization, of decoupling, and of balkanization of the global economy. It's going to start and it's starting with the global tech supply chain because of the Huawei ban. There is an exemption right now. But guess what? What happened in the case of the United States that was interesting is that the financial warfare Last year started, it was the very first time in which instead of having financial sanction, we also impose on China technological sanction. In the past, the deal of the US was I impose sanction against Korea, against Iran, against Russia, against China. Either you follow me or I'm going to cut you off, as James was pointing out, from the dollar financial system. And therefore, Europe and everybody else has to say, yes, sir, I'm going to follow you because you want to risk that. With the ZTE case, and it was the first one, it was the very first time that the US told the, to ZTE, because you have bypassed the sanction against Iran, I'm not going to let you buy my semiconductors. So ZTE, that was a smaller telecom firm in China, was on the verge of being destroyed because not of a financial sanction, but of a technological sanction. When that thing happened, I remember I was in Beijing, the Chinese knew perfectly well that the US was only a matter of time until the next target would be not ZTE, that was small but important, but Huawei, that is the biggest telecom company in the entire world. So Huawei knew perfectly well that at some point the US would take one excuse or another, you know, the excuse being a national security threat to the United States, to pull the plug on the Huawei. And that's exactly what happened when they decided in May to put it on the entity list. And literally, Huawei, at least its global business, could have been completely destroyed. Now that there is a truce and there are negotiations, the US has said, well, for the time being, we're going to give you an exemption for the time being. The reality is that the Chinese, a year ago, after the ZTE case, said, we cannot rely anymore on US semiconductor for the production of our own technology. So they had already a plan to make sure that they phase out the United States. And today, there are already 1,200 US alone uh, suppliers to Huawei of components of semiconductors and so on. So there's actually an economic impact on the United States. So the decision by China had already been made. We're not going to rely on the US because they're willing to use not just financial warfare, but warfare, but also technological warfare. And we cannot be in a situation which our biggest telecom company is going to be completely destroyed because of a political decision by the United States. 
So once you made that decision, the U.S. gone down, down the road, is a road that leads you to deglobalization, to balkanization of the global economy, and decoupling. And it's not just on the tech, because tomorrow, every good that you're going to buy is going to have a 5G chip. Your toaster from China is going to have a 5G chip. Your microwave, even a cup of tea, is going to have something that's going to track it. And what's going to be happening is that then the tech war becomes a trade war. Because at that point we can say, I cannot buy the toaster from China, because in a world in which there is hundreds of billions of Internet of Things, connected devices, even a simple toaster or my little machine or whatever not, they can spy on us and therefore we cannot buy not only their 5G and their smartphones, we cannot even buy their toasters. So you have a destruction of global trade. And that supply shock on the global economy is so severe that once we start along those lines, you'll have a global recession. So, and the cost of it is going to burn by the United States as much as China. So we play with fire. And the idea that we have this financial warfare, that we can do whatever we want to, we can impose regime change on other countries, is totally naive and eventually is going to come to haunt us and damage us as well. Well, I was in a, uh, a meeting at the Pentagon and uh, sitting next to a, a Treasury official, and I made remarks similar to what I did at the beginning of this session, uh, Noriel, about the vulnerabilities of the dollar, and I'll come to that in a second. And uh, my interlocutor uh, said, hold on, I started pounding the table. He said, the dollar has been the global reserve currency. It is the global reserve currency today, and it always will be the global reserve currency. And I said, uh, David, I feel like I'm sitting in Whitehall in 1913, listening to John Bull talk about how the sterling is the global reserve currency and always will be, and it, its demise has, has started within a year at the beginning of uh, uh, World War I. Uh, that's a lot to unpack, but just a couple observations. I'm familiar with the studies in the 70s. Uh, Gary Hoffbauer was a leader in that, and you're right. It was slow and ineffective, and uh, I don't dispute that, but I go back to my first point, which is the world has changed because of interconnectedness and complexity, because of the payment system, the role of the dollar, uh, there are far more vulnerabilities and the weapons are far more powerful, so those studies from the 70s don't uh, necessarily apply to where we are today. I agree with you that you have to choose your targets carefully. Uh, target selection is always uh, critical. Uh, when we first started putting sanctions on Russia, I mean, what happened there was uh, MI6 and CIA tried to destabilize uh, Ukraine, get rid of a pro-Russian um, prime minister, it was a bridge too far. Um, that backfired pretty badly and then Russia took Crimea and intervened in eastern Ukraine, and, and they're still there. Uh, and then we put sanctions on Russia, but you've got, you got to remember who started that. It was really, uh, it was really the United States and, and the UK. Putin, from his perspective, was just uh, reacting. But So we threw very heavy economic sanctions on Russia. They're still in place. They've been tightened. Trump has tightened them successfully. But I, I agree with you, Noria. I never thought they would work because Russia is uh, much closer to an autarkic economy, always has been. Uh, the reaction of the Russians to that kind of adversity, whether it's Napoleon, uh, Hitler, or um, Obama, Trump sanctions, is past the vodka. I mean, they, they hunker down and they get through it, uh, and certainly the world needs their oil. So I wouldn't, and I didn't, and I still don't expect much change in, in Russian behavior. I think the other cases are completely different. You know, there's an old uh, saying for, I'm sure poker players have heard it, uh, if you're in a poker game and you don't know who the sucker is, you are the sucker meaning in poker games, two or three players will always unite against the designated sucker and clean them out, then they'll kind of turn on each other. Uh, there are only three countries in the world that really matter, Russia, China, and the United States. Uh, and I don't care what the Russian GDP is, they're, they have the largest arsenal of nuclear weapons in the world, the largest land mass, and they're one of the three, uh, about 10% of global output of oil, so, so they count. And uh, so when you're in that three-handed poker game, US, Russia, and China, you're supposed to make buddies and, in effect, attack or isolate the other guy. So, and the U.S. is very, very good at this, and Henry Kissinger understood this perfectly. So in the uh, 70s, uh, we pivoted towards China to isolate Russia. In the 90s, we pivoted after Tiananmen Square. We pivoted to Russia to isolate China. You can switch sides, but you, it's always you and the other guy against the third guy. Um, under Obama and, uh, in, and running up to Trump, and I, was, I saw this, I was amazed to see it, uh, opinion in the United States, in the Congress, and in Washington was that we couldn't talk to Russia. You know, that I, I won't have to recite the whole history of you know, Russian collusion and all that, but we couldn't talk to Russia. So the idea that the United States could align with Russia to isolate the real enemy, which is China, uh, was somehow 
off limits. Well, that makes us the sucker. Right now it's Russia and China versus the United States. So we're in a very bad position that way. But having said that, uh, these, uh, uh, we are headed for a regime change in Iran. It's just a matter of time. They came to the table once. They're thinking about coming to the table a second time. Uh, we're not really in an adversarial position with Europe. There's some you know, noise about uh, tariffs on autos. Uh, the faster we deglobalize, the better. Uh, you know, China today, you have a situation, so you're a Uyghur or you're a Catholic in Western China and you're a dissident. Uh, what happens first, you're arrested, you're sent to a uh, thought a re-education center, in effect a concentration camp for communist ideology. But if you don't get with the program, they'll strap you to an operating table without anesthetic and remove your organs to fuel a multi-billion dollar organ transplant industry, which is a fast growing industry in China. Why you would want to, and of course the person dies, but they have crematoria to deal with the bodies, and we've seen that uh, movie before. My question is why you would want to do any commerce with China. That, that would be my starting place uh, in terms of how we deal with them. But having said that, it's not that the U.S. can overwhelm China with financial or technological weapons. China, societies usually destabilize or rot from the inside. Again, we're not going to invade China. Uh, you know, <laughs> the ghost of MacArthur is not still around. I mean, President Truman got that right. Um, but China will rot from the inside with pressure from the outside, and that's exactly uh, what we're doing. Now, however, one area where I do agree with you, Noriel, and again, I had this debate. Um, I was in a meeting in Washington recently with a lot of um, pretty senior national security officials, and one, one guy was just moaning, he said, I, he was an American, he said, I just got back from Europe and I was meeting with uh, you know, NATO delegates and foreign ministers and deputies, and they're just, they're in anguish, they're shaking their heads, they can't believe Trump, they can't figure him out. He says one thing one, one day, the next thing the other, the next day, they don't know what to do, they don't know what the reaction function uh, could be, they can't wait till uh, 2021. And I said, go back to Europe and talk to your friends and, and your uh, associates and tell them they're gonna wake up on January 15, 2025, and Trump is still gonna be president. And they better adjust to that today if they wanna be able to pursue this policy. The, so the idea that the Iranians are gonna sit around, wait out Trump, or the Europeans are gonna sit around and wait out Trump is, is badly mistaken. My advice would be, Figure the guy out, he's from Queens, he's not that, not that hard to figure out. Uh, you know, he's a businessman, not a career politician, he's not as polished, I get it. But, uh, but you, that's who you're gonna have to deal with and he's got some very able people around him, including uh, um, you know, Mike Pompeo and others. So my, my point being, um, the, the financial targets are more vulnerable because the system is more interconnected. The weapons are more powerful uh, for the same reason, there are more of them. Uh, and it really comes down to political will. Do you have the will to use it? Do you have the will to achieve a result? And I would say Trump does have that will. Now, the, the other thing I, I agree with you, Noriel, is this notion of the bully, and I've said this to people in Washington quite frequently. I say, you can overdo it. In fact, you probably are overdoing it. You have to be more selective in your targets, more clear in your goals. You can't just throw these weapons around. And it is like the bully uh, the dollar bully who comes into the schoolyard and beats up a little kid and then comes in the next day and beats up another little kid and so forth. One day the bully shows up and the kids have formed a gang. All the little guys have formed a gang and they beat up the bully. And that's how these things end. So what the United States needs to be thinking about at this point, uh, I think the weapons are effective. I think they can be used. And I think we can achieve a lot of national security and geopolitical goals with them. But we have to be aware of the reaction function. And I'll just I'll be very brief in terms of what that is. Um, did a war game for the Pentagon in 2009, first ever financial war game. I was the facilitator. Uh, they didn't need help from me on planning war games in general, but they, they were reaching out for help on the financial side. And with a friend who was like, I was on the China team, he was on the Russia team. We met for drinks, we cooked up a, an interesting scenario. We said we gotta you know, keep this interesting. And uh, uh, we had Russia and China uh, pooling their gold in a uh, depository that anyone could join with a bank of issue in London, because the UK is good rule of law, uh, and basically go into a gold-backed currency. And if you wanted some, you could either deposit your gold, get the currency, or run a trading surplus with Russia and China and earn some currency that way, or there would be a lending facility, et cetera. But basically, it was a gold-backed currency plan run by Russia and China that would sideline the US dollar. Um, you know, there's a lot of detail there, but uh, it was forward-leaning. Um, and we had, you know, we had CIA, FBI, uh, Treasury Department, think tank people, university scholars, what I call the usual suspects. And the, the big brains from Harvard basically laughed at us. 
uh, when we introduce this. They actually have a, you have like a red team and a white team and a blue team. There's one team of referees. And when we introduced this, when our move, well, here's what we're doing with gold, they said, that's an illegal move. And I, I objected vigorously. I said, this is a war. What, there are no illegal moves in a war, OK? And they debated it. And they said, OK, we'll let you do it, but we don't think it's going to work. Well, two days later, it had led to a significant, in the, in the view of the judges, and there was a three-star general there, it had led to a significant accretion in power in favor of Russia um, as it's played out. That was 10 years ago. What's happened in the last 10 years? It has played out exactly as we warned the Pentagon at the time. Russia has tripled its gold reserves. China has tripled its gold reserves. Probably more, but they're non-transparent about it. Uh, so these are all facts. This is not you know, Jules Verne, late 21st century science fiction. These are facts. Russia and China are working on uh, heavily encrypted, what's called a permissioned distributed ledger. Distributed ledger is just a fancy name for blockchain. Uh, permissioned is a big deal because it's like a club. You only get in if the admissions committee lets you into the club. Uh, anybody, I can go mine a blockchain, uh, you know, this after, or sorry, mine a Bitcoin uh, this afternoon if I feel like it. That's an open uh, blockchain. But permission means we have a club, you're only in if we, we say you're in. Uh, so the club would be, uh, so call it the Putin coin or the Xi coin, take your pick. Uh, it's, this is not the ruble, not the yuan. Those are not ready, there's not, not going to be reserve currencies anytime soon. Uh, but it's a new token, digital token. Um, the initial members would be Russia, China, Turkey, Iran. Uh, let's count in our friends from North Korea. Uh, China could very well prevail upon Hong Kong to join, which is a major commercial center. And maybe a couple of BRICs, uh, like uh, you know, Brazil or others, would want to join in as well. They would set up a, tra uh, a trading network. They would keep score in this new token. Uh, so Iran could sell oil to China. China could sell uh, infrastructure to Russia. Russia could sell natural gas to China. Everyone take a vacation in Turkey because it's a nice place. But they get this whole thing going, keep score in the token. But I mean, you can keep score in baseball cards. That's just a way of tracking it. But periodically, twice a year, once a year, you settle up in physical bullion. The amount of physical bullion needed to support that trading network is, is a lot less. If you do it on a net basis, it's one thing if everyone's paying gross to everyone else. If you do it on a net basis twice a year, you need a lot less gold to make that system work and then eventually expand that network. What's missing from what I just described? The dollar. There's no dollar anywhere in, in that system. So they're working towards that. I'm not saying the dollar goes away as, as a global reserve currency overnight. I'm just saying that the kids who are getting picked on are getting ready to confront the bully. And in that sense, I, I, agree, with, uh, I agree with your point. Um, no, on the last point, uh, I certainly agree with you. I mean, so far, the US dollar remains the main reserve currency because uh, there's not much of a, an alternative. You know, the euro might uh, collapse. Uh, Japan never wanted to internationalize the yen. With Brexit, the British pound is weak. Swiss franc is too small. And in my view, gold has a limited role. is a reserve currency, but it's a fraction of uh, global uh, reserves. And one of the risks that the US is facing uh, is that if you are keep on playing this game of financial warfare, it takes time. It takes probably 10, 20 years. But whether it's China and Russia trying to get away from the SWIFT system or not being reliant on uh, using the dollar as payments or not having their funding in dollar, but otherwise, you know, Russia has tried its own Eurasian nation to try to find a bunch of allies that can have an economic trading and financial area and so on. It's going to take time, but the idea that eventually you can bypass the US dollar as a unit of account, as a means of payment, as a store of value, and so on in international transaction is not totally far-fetched. And certainly China, uh, it's a rising power uh, in financial innovation and payment system, actually. They're much more sophisticated than we are. You know, Alipay and WeChat Pay are used now by billions of Chinese for billion transactions a day. And now they can use it also when they go abroad and eventually they're going to offer similar kind of e-commerce and financial services and payment system that are not reliant on the US dollar to other countries that are their friends and allies and so on. And I would say that uh, over time, by the way, uh, you know, the Chinese may receive some damage from this economic and tech and trade war in the short run, but you know, their 5G is much better than the US and European, is much cheaper. And I was at a conference just during the past weekend uh, with uh, a bunch of people, including President Kagame of Rwanda. And he says, 
Uh, our 5G is all Huawei. We are receiving all this infrastructure from China. Yes, is there a backdoor and they can spy on us? It's possible. But if I use uh, US Telecom, the NSA is going to spy on me. So if you're a small country, you know, that either you're using the US technology or the Chinese technology, somebody's going to spy on you. And as long as you have friends and allies, you're receiving trade, you're receiving finance, you're receiving infrastructure, they get cheap finance for their infrastructure, they get the 5G and so on. Uh, you know, they have no say. And most countries in the world have to choose uh, who's going to be their big ally and there are only few superpowers. And for most of the world that is not democratic, that is an emerging market, Chinese goods are better, they're cheaper, they're offering you infrastructure, they're offering you financing at cheap rates, they're offering you technology. Most of Africa, most of Asia, um, most of Latin America, even parts of uh, most of Central Asia and, um, and uh, Pacific and so on, apart from maybe our allies in Europe and so on, are going to go for the Chinese technology. So once there is this deglobalization and the Chinese are going to say, you are with us or you're against us, 5G, AI, robotic automation, the US is going to say the same, most of the world is going to go with China. And even the allies of the United States, whether in Europe or Middle East or Latin America and Asia, today all these allies of the US are doing more trade and finance and FDI with China than they're doing with the United States. So they are formally allies of the United States, but actually the economic and trading and financial relations are strongly with China. And China is going to be able to put pressure on some of them to go with China. Even in Europe, it's not so obvious. Maybe the UK is going to give up on 5G coming from Huawei, but it's not obvious that Germany is going to do that, as opposed to just playing both parts. You know, uh, China is an economic initiative now with 16 countries in Central and Eastern Europe, most of them members of the EU, some of them not the members of the EU, to do trade and business. That's uh, the BRI. Italy is a G7 country, just decided to join the BRI. And China is a formidable power. So eventually they're going to decouple from the United States, trade, tech, financial and otherwise, and they're going to offer to the world economic system, payment system, e-commerce system, even surveillance system, because many countries are, are not very democratic. And the Chinese are going to say, our surveillance system is good for us and maybe good for you. And there are plenty of dictators or semi-dictators or rising authoritarian and autocrats all over the world, even in advanced economies, even in Italy. Uh, let, let alone in other parts of the world. So, so this is the consequence of what's going to happen if we play financial warfare the way we're playing it. Another point that I repeat to myself, again, you can use financial warfare, but whether you use it against Cuba or against Iran or against North Korea or against uh, Russia or against China, so far has not led to regime change. Uh, with the exception of China, many of these countries are in a situation of semi-economic and trading uh, autarky. Certainly North Korea is in autarky, certainly Cuba is near autarky. Even Iran, even before the sanctions, they were exporting only 2 million barrels a day. And now with the sanctions, they're going to be maybe back to half a million. Yeah, they lose a couple of billion dollars a year. But Iran is producing everything. Even toilet paper is produced at home. So they are effectively in economic and trading autarky. And if this full autarky because of the sanction, the sanctions are there, they're going to live with it. You don't understand what the arenas are, I'm sorry. The idea that there's going to be sudden regime change before the US election is just nonsense. Anybody who's against the regime now is blaming the United States. You're imposing lots of pain and suffering on the average Iranian, and they're supporting now the regime. Iran went through 10 years of a war with Iraq, in which they sent hundreds of thousands of people to the front web, barely with any weapons. Millions of them died, and the regime survived. The idea you're going to impose economic sanctions, there's going to be regime change in Iran, is just total, utter nonsense. You want to go to war, you want to bomb the hell out of them, you want to send troops on the ground, you may be able to have regime change, and then you own it like you owned it in Afghanistan and Iraq, and we know what happened in that case. The idea you're going to have regime change with financial sanctions in Iran is just a joke. It's not going to happen. They're going to survive. It may collapse eventually for other reasons, because internally people are unhappy with them, but that's going to be a different story. It's going to take time. But what we're doing with the sanction reinforces political regime, doesn't make it weaker. And with China that is not aut autarkic, they can retaliate with us in 10 different ways. And if we play this game, as I pointed out, eventually two thirds of the world is going to go with China and their economic, financial, trading, payment, 
and political and even surveillance model. That's the way the world is going to go, at least two thirds of it. Most emerging markets and even some advanced economies. We are not going to win this battle with China by playing hardball. We have uh, just about five minutes, so if you guys, if you could just one or two questions. Yeah, uh, in, the front, in the front. Thank you. Um, I just have a quick question uh, for both of you, or, and also specifically, you know, Nouriel. So the whole impetus with this trade war with China from the populist perspective is the, the balance of payments issue, obviously the intellectual property issue, uh, the currency devaluing issue. How would you solve those problems without doing the trade war? Um, first of all, I, I, I would say that you know, there are plenty of legitimate reasons why we are unhappy, the same way in which the, uh, the European, the Japanese, and many others are unhappy with the behavior of China. And there are a wide range of unfair trade and financial practices. Uh, you have to engage China. Maybe you have to be tough with them. But uh, I don't think you can bully them. I think that they, an approach in which you had involved your allies like Europeans and Japanese and others to go and tell China a certain type of behavior is not acceptable uh, would have been more effective than that doing it uh, unilaterally. And, um, and, and I would say that regardless of the normative aspects, so we want the Chinese behavior to change because it's unfair, uh, you have to realize that most likely from a positive point of view, I would say trade is going to be the smallest of the issues we have to worry about. You know, the Chinese, yeah, they can buy a little more of soybeans. They can buy a little more of corn. They can buy a little more of LNG from us. They can commit to increase their exports. But we live in a world in which China is a rising power. US is the existing power that has relatively less power than before. And therefore, the two cities trap is going to occur. It's going to occur regardless of. And the consequence of it is not going to be soybean or LNG. It's going to be tech. And from tech, it goes to all sorts of goods that have also technology embedded to it. I do worry that we are heading towards the globalization. We are worried uh, that we are headed towards a decoupling and balkanization. And I fear that unless there is a real regime change, both in China and the United States, we're not going to be able to avoid it. You need a Democrat who has a different approach to China. There's not containment. You have to have somebody that's less authoritarian in China than President Xi Jinping that decided to become an economic nationalist and also flex his muscle on foreign policy. And maybe the two sides are going to find somewhere down the line a way of finding a way of living together while they're competing and cooperating. Given the current leadership on the country and the trends, I fear we are on a collision course, and I don't know what we can do to avoid it. But the, the, the history of the 1920s and 30s is first you have a currency war, then you have a trade war, then you have a shooting war. Today we're going down the same path. The currency war started in 2010. Trade war, at least our response, started in 2018. We're inching closer to a shooting war. So the way to prevent that is to go back to square one. How do you prevent the currency war? Because that's the easiest way to cheat in terms of your trading partners. And the way to do that is to have a a stable anchor that's not the dollar or the yuan, uh, but gold, gold back currency, gold back SDR, some anchor so that you, you wouldn't have currency wars. In other words, not unlike the original uh, Bretton Woods vision. That was, that was more dollar based. I, I don't think the new one could be dollar based. Uh, you know, a gold back SDR Are would SDRs be a good. No, they're not. They're not. They used to be. When they, when they were created in 1969, they were backed by gold, but then they abandoned that. But you could go back to that pretty easily. I, I don't buy that argument because I believe that currency is not the key reason why there is the trade imbalance between the U.S. and China. China saves a lot. The U.S. saves very little in the private and public sector. And we have doubled down on increasing our public debt savings by having huge tax cuts and spending increase. And our trade deficit with China is going to fundamentally worsen regardless of the value of the currency. You know, that's the fundamental reason. It's not the currency of Chinese essentially devaluing and essentially debasing and so on. That's not the main driver. So I don't think stability of the currency is, is the right answer to this problem. We have to save more and they have to save less and consume more. That might over time lead to a reduction. But my, my point of view is even if there was a trade balance, and China, by the way, not on a bilateral basis, but overall, is going to over time going towards a current account balance or even a deficit because they're increasing consumption over time and they're saving less. Uh, they're going to go in that direction. The tech and the trade war and the geopolitical war between the US and China today has to do with the fact of the Americans saying there's a trade imbalance, you're stealing our jobs and this and that. Uh, tomorrow, even with trade balance, it's going to be a technological war. Uh, China wants to be top in the 
AI, in robotic, in automation, in 5Gs, and in made in China in the 10 top industries of the future. For us, this is a threat. We have to stop them. We're going to start a trade and attack war based on national security. The trade balance is just an excuse. Just one more question. They, they don't. Uh, you could transfer, I mean, you could have, a, you know, some kind of exchange where you can convert from one to the other. But the whole idea of a permissions blockchain, of course, it's, it's like a club, members only. The IMF could start one. They have 188 or 189 members. They could have a permission blockchain in a gold back SDR that would be used for a settlement, a settlement of balance of payments. It wouldn't be walking around money. We wouldn't use it at the bar tonight, but you could use it in, in international transactions. But the permission uh, is not only a political tool, which it is, it is a political tool, but it also makes it uh, sustainable and scalable. The problem with Bitcoin, it's not sustainable, it's not scalable. Uh, you'll be using more electricity than Japan in a few years. That will not be allowed to happen. But the minute you make it permissioned, the, um, the governance aspect, the security aspect is way down, need a lot less energy, and it's a lot more sustainable. What about people who want to opt out of these government-controlled systems? Well, they're free to do so. In fact, most people wouldn't be in the government-controlled system because you'd only be in, allowed in if they, if they wanted you in. But my suggestion is not that, uh, my suggestion is that's their alternative to the dollar. I mean, I would add that the term cryptocurrency is a misnomer because none of these cryptocurrencies starting with Bitcoin is either a unit of account or a means of payment, you know, five transactions per second. The Visa system allows you to do 25,000 transactions per second. And it's not a stable store of value. You know, the value of Bitcoin can go up 10% or down 10, 20% in a day. I mean, I was recently at the a blockchain Bitcoin conference where the organizers don't accept Bitcoin for paying for the conference fees. Why? Because during that week, the price of Bitcoin fell 20%. So if they accepted Bitcoin, their entire profit margin would have disappeared. So even those guys are not idiotic enough to accept Bitcoin <laughs> as a means of payment or unit account. So that, that, that's not going anywhere. That's not going anywhere. Then you have the Vitalik Buterin inconsistent trinity. It says you cannot have scalability, decentralization, and security. In fiat systems, you have systems that are centralized, yes, but they are scalable and they are secure. If I lose my credit card or somebody steals it, in 30 seconds, I block the account, I'm fully refunded, I get my money back. While in, in crypto, it's not scalable, it's not decentralized, that's bullshit, because you have centralization of miners, of exchanges, of developers, and centralization of wealth. And it's not secure, because unless you hide in a piece of paper your, you know, private key, uh, Stone Age technology, and you put in cold storage your money, anybody can come and steal it. So it's centralized, it's not secure, it's not scalable, it's not a currency, it's just a joke. And on blockchain, <laughs> all this blockchain enterprise DLT is bigger bullshit because they're pub they private, they're not public, they're permissioned, they're not permissionless, they're centralized, they're not decentralized, and they're based on a trusted set of limited people who can authenticate a transaction and they're not therefore trustless. So they call them blockchain, but then none of them is blockchain. And even by being private, permission and centralized, not a single one of them has gone beyond proof of testing into application that works. None of them is going to work. So it's just, it's a total nonsense, these cryptocurrencies and this blockchain. It's the biggest fad in human history, and it's not going anywhere. It's just nowhere. The, big, the biggest, uh, the biggest, digital, the biggest digital cryptocurrency in the world is the U.S. dollar. It's all, it's all encrypted. It's all digital. You got a couple bucks in your pocket, but uh, it, it can work. What I was describing, by the way, you would fix the value. So whether it's gold or an SDR or something, uh, so it, that solves the uh, unstable value. Pardon me? Uh, China and Russia are building something like that. They're not ready to roll it out because they have to get a little more gold. I mean, now they're doing a lot of things in, in cryptocurrencies, and there are other private initiatives, but they are, they are working on the system I described. You, you could fix the store of value by anchoring it to something, gold or SDRs, for example. Uh, and it's, it doesn't meet the decentralized libertarian view of a lot of cryptocurrency supporters. I'm, I'm not saying that. It's not that, you know, there's no such thing as a cryptocurrency. There are 5,000 kinds of cryptocurrencies different governance, different technology, et cetera. What I'm describing uh, looks a lot more like, uh, uh, you know, where the, uh, looks a lot more like a bank core, actually. 